Thank you all for being here in what is our third workshop in a three workshop series um, sponsored by the Diversity Project Development Fund of CUNY. So um, there are many familiar faces here and I appreciate the support that you've given the series throughout the semester, so thank you. Uh, today we're gonna actually do something a little bit different. We're going to talk about um, students with learning disabilities and then in the second half of our time together we are gonna have a webinar. So I hope that if you're able, you'll stick around for the webinar. Uh, the webinar is actually focused on um, inclusive service learning. So integrating much of what we've talked about this semester in regards to students with disabilities with a high impact practice that is um, so popular on our campus and so well done, thanks to Joe there in the back, um, on our campus, um, you know, specifically service learning. So I'm going to um, offer a few introductory comments like all the comments that I've been making throughout the course of the semester. A lot of this information is new to me. I'm learning right alongside of um, all of you and in many cases some of you are more expert than I am. So uh, I appreciate your patience but I do want to offer a little bit of context to uh, Gail Glass Malley's comments that she's going to make um, more targeted comments about students with disabilities, specifically learning disabilities. So um, I don't know about you, but I needed a definition of learning disability. And the definition that I found um, that seemed to be um, most appropriate is from the Learning Disabilities Association of America. And a learning disability, I'm showing this um, a little bit fuzzy up here, and you've got it on your screens in front of you, is a neurological condition that interferes with a person's ability to store, process, or produce information. They can impact a person's ability to read, write, speak, spell, compute math, and reason. They can also affect a person's attention, memory, coordination, social skills, and emotional maturity. Obviously, these are all things that uh, relate to our work in the classroom, relate to our work in the tutoring centers. So learning disabilities are a big concern for us and a big um, area for our work. So under um, the um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and also the Americans with Disabilities Act, students with learning disabilities are a protected category. The federal government's definition of a learning disability rests on three components and it's a little bit different than the definition that I just provided for you. I think it adds some nuance to the conversation. So according to the federal government, learning disabilities are defined by three components average or above average intellectual abilities, academic achievements significantly below that, um, what is expected of an individual at those abilities, and a deficit in one or more of the cognitive processes underlying learning. So what the federal government is stressing here, and what I think is important for us to remember, is that learning disabilities are often defined by this gap, right? A gap between what we expect students to be able to achieve because of their intellectual abilities and what they are actually able to achieve um, in reality. So here's um, something interesting as well that I'm uh, learning right alongside of you. Um, there uh, is an understanding of learning disabilities as this sort of umbrella label and it includes all of these different um, and complex and related disorders. Each of these disorders exhibit a wide variety of characteristic skills, struggles, and behavioral patterns and each obviously in that way requires different types of treatment and or accommodations. Given this breadth, Right, this umbrella, the breadth of the umbrella label, there's some disagreement about what categories or what um, disorders actually fall under the learning disability label, particularly around um, ADHD and ADD. Um, current estimates estimate that approximately 10 to 15 percent of the human population is actually impacted very directly by a learning disability. So this is a significant uh, portion of human population, obviously a significant portion of our student body and of ourselves quite likely. So college students with a learning disability, this is an area of growth for um, higher education. One third of first year students with disabilities report having learning disabilities. Um, this number has grown since 1985 by approximately 15 percentage points, from 15% to 32% of those self-reported students with disabilities. Most students with learning disabilities, or um, the majority of them, tend to come or to start their education at community colleges. So this is a topic of um, real relevance to our students and the work that we do here. 
Once in college, one thing that's interesting is that students with learning disabilities at community colleges are more likely to avail themselves of the services that um, are appropriate to them in the community college context as opposed to their counterparts at four-year schools. So they're more likely to come to community colleges, students with learning disabilities, and once they're here, they're more likely to participate in um, targeted LD programs, which is, I guess, uh, very good news for us. That being said, the transition to college is very difficult for uh, all students, but um, more specifically for students with a learning disability. And the reasons are plenty. First of all, um, in contrast to high school learning experiences, there's a lot more independent learning and a lot less instructional um, faculty to student time faculty and um, members of staff on college campuses, including community college campuses, have high expectations for their students. And these might not meet the same expectations that uh, folks had for these students in high school. Students have study skill deficit, um, memorization issues, um, study uh, issues such as um, you know, how to read the text, which I know we're going to talk a little bit with Gail about today. They also bring with them basic skills deficits. Um, they also bring with them curricular deficits. And like most students with um, disabilities on college campuses, they are um, bound to advocate for themselves and also um, self-identify. So this is a combination, a confluence of factors that can make this transition to college quite difficult for uh, students with learning disabilities. Um, if they have uh, limited experience or exposure or in-depth knowledge to an actual um, disciplinary knowledge? Okay. okay. Yep, of course. Um, so uh, given the breadth of the um, learning, or learning disability label, uh, there are a lot of accommodations that um, are suitable to this student population. <coughs> learning disabilities tend to be diagnosed by a battery of aptitude and academic achievement tests. And these tests are required to establish not just the need for services, but the um, actual services that students will receive. And as mentioned, these services tend to be um, quite diverse. You might uh, be aware of students with learning disabilities in your classes or in your centers because of the actual accommodations that you've been asked to make. So perhaps you've been asked to make note taking or testing. Uh, perhaps you've been asked to make reading, writing, or math accommodations in the appropriate disciplines. Or perhaps you've been asked to be flexible with students' use of assistive technologies in spaces like exams. So before I turn um, the floor over to um, uh, Gail, um, I'm going to uh, remind you of the upcoming events that we have next week. It's the final event in this workshop and lecture series. It's a campus-wide lecture. Um, it's titled Coming of Age with a Disability, Research and Policy in the United States. It's next Wednesday during club hours from 2 to 3 in S111. It's open to students, staff, and faculty, so I certainly hope you'll encourage your students to attend. Um, it's going to be a really interesting talk on the research of Dr. Carrie Chandra, who is an assistant professor of sociology at Stony Brook and also a health sciences faculty member there. Uh, her research is really exciting. She juxtaposes uh, the experiences, developmental and otherwise, of students with disabilities to um, typical students in the United States, finds a lot of similarities, finds some really intriguing um, differences that we'll have some time to talk about together next week. So please, I do encourage you to come and also um, to encourage your students to come. And I'd be ris remiss if I didn't mention all the people who've made this uh, series possible, particularly now as we wind this series down. Obviously, CUNY's um, Diversity Project Development Fund grant um, really allowed this to happen. But also all these other offices here at Queensboro, most um, specifically the SSD office and the great work of Ben and Carlos have made this possible. And they have two wonderful students who've helped me. Um, Siobhan and Reggie as well. So that's been, um, that's been great too. So I'd like to turn the floor over to Gail Glass-Malley, who is from Kingsborough Community College, from the SSD office there, and who has uh, much more experience than I in the field of learning disabilities and who will be teaching me a great deal. So I thank her for coming and, and being with us today. So 
just a little about my background. Um, I did my master's level school psychology internship at Kingsborough Community College with someone who is no longer the director of uh, my program. But um, he used to work a lot with uh, learning disabilities and um, used to conduct a lot of tutoring sessions and um, had a lot of discussions with him. And I remember this must have been certainly over 15 years ago, probably longer than that. Um, a faculty member who was relatively new came in and asked him, you know, I think I might have some students in the class that have disabilities, but I'm not sure. They're not coming in, they're not really telling me anything, but I can see from their work that they're not learning, and I have some concerns about how I should be teaching this class. And his recommendation, I think, kind of foreshadows something that I think you were discussing in the last workshop, which is universal design, but what his comment was, okay, what I think you should do is act as though half of your class is deaf and the other half of your class is blind. So I'm wondering, does anybody have any kinds of feelings about why he might have said something like that? Want to take a, a guess? Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. I think someone else had um, a hand up. Yep. Well, I was just going to say this is something similar to the fact that um, playing to all different learning styles in the classroom. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Um, he was trying to address the fact that people, regardless of whether they have a disability or not, do have different learning styles and they absorb information differentially. There will be blind students who, unless they're kinesthetic learners and are not likely to have that much kinesthetic activity in the classroom, are going to have to listen to what's being said to absorb information. Um, and there are going to be um, deaf students who, yes, are likely, if they read sign language, and most of them do, not that many come from the oral tradition where they didn't even learn sign language, um, are going to be looking at PowerPoint displays and are going to be looking at films that are being run that are, that are captioned. Um, and the thing that gets to be really pretty interesting with the universal design stuff is that um, people have found, because there have been curb cuts, that there are all kinds of students on campus that are transporting their book bags on, wheel or, on wheels. There are people who are wheelchair users for who it was originally put in, um, who benefit by, from it. Um, and so things that were put into place with one population, a lot of times um, considered are helpful to other populations as well. Um, and I was telling Amy about two weeks ago, I went to a presentation at Brooklyn College where the speaker is someone that you might be familiar with. His name is Stephen Shore, and he teaches at Adelphi, and he has Asperger's, or actually high-functioning autism, um, which is not anything that you would really be able to pick up from the presentation. But he kept making references to universal design um, and saying how helpful it would be. Um, and when you think about it, when you are in a classroom situation, I would really encourage all of you, um, because you may have students that have learning disabilities, and you may have people who are visual learners who benefit from getting captioning um, on the film, which is there mostly for students who are hard of hearing. But the thing is, you'll also have ESL students, and those ESL students are probably going to love to be able to hear the spoken word and be able to print it. So um, people do learn in many different ways. A lot of people are multisensory learners, so it's not only the idea that they're getting visual information, it's the idea that they are getting auditory information. But um, you know, the, the classroom situation has really changed. And one thing that often happens is though um, that even though students with learning disabilities are the largest segment of the population in, on campus, uh, with disabilities, um, some of them, because they have a hidden disability, try to pass for not having one. So they may go to Ben's office and ask for accommodation sheets and self-disclose, or they may not do that because some of them are going to be quite content with getting a C because they are really concerned about self-disclosing. 
So probably in other presentations, you've learned what you can ask and what you can ask. So you know that you can never ask a student if they have a disability. If that's something that they disclose to you, that's another situation. But if you are treating your classrooms as though you do have people that are having struggles with learning, there are different kinds of strategies that, that you can um, try to use. So uh, that's kind of some of the things that um, I hope to go into with you. Does anybody have any questions to begin with, actually? Yes. Ah, okay. What Universal Design started off was it was a bunch of architects that were really looking to make buildings access as accessible as possible so that it would be user friendly. Um, and then what happened was that educators took a look at what was happening and thinking that um, if the classroom situation was adapted in such a way that learning could encompass more students, it would be better. So even though um, part of why universal design was developed was to meet the needs of students with disabilities who you know, might need to sit in front of the, of the class or might need text in alternate format, there are going to be other students in your class who don't have any disability or have never been diagnosed that are really going to benefit from your teaching or doing things in a different way. One of the things that seems to be very common on college campuses, and I'm not saying it is the wrong thing, um, is that um, it tends to cater towards an extroverted population. And estimates are that 40% of people are introverted. So a lot of times classroom situations have moved to the model where there's a lot of interaction, sometimes in English classes where people are trading things back and forth. Um, and there may be many students who are very comfortable. But, you know, the first, I think the first population that you were talking about uh, was students that are on the spectrum. And if they have Asperger's, they may not be that comfortable in having the interchange with their, you know, fellow students. Um, but I'm saying that, that there's a whole spectrum of different learners. So you've got your quiet people that don't want to do that. Um, one of the things that I would really encourage is um, sometimes when people teach English, they ask students to read. And I would really discourage you from doing that because if you have students that are having comprehension problems, just the nervousness of le reading aloud is going to be an issue for some. Some will truly have a learning disability and they can't do that. And they will maybe try to adapt and do what you're asking of them, but feel very uncomfortable. But the thing is that what you would be trying to accomplish, a lot of times you're not going to really undermine your curriculum by pulling that component out. So there are certain things that you, know, you might want to avoid, and, and that would possibly be one of them. Um, let me just take a peek at some of the stuff that I have in terms of um, strategies. So there are going to be professors um, that write a fair amount on the blackboard, but a lot of times professors don't, and that's fine. Um, students have to learn how to adapt to the classroom situation. Some of them are going to be entitled to have a note taker. Some of them, possibly if they have a learning disability, are going to be entitled to tape record the lectures and maybe not so surprisingly, if you've been to Staples recently, you might have seen smart pens advertised. And I've heard students on the bus who certainly don't have disabilities talking about how they plan on buying them. And what smart pens do is they look like, you know, very thick pens, um, but they're tape recorders. And you use special paper and you can take notes. But chances are, from what I've heard from other students, um, who find out that, yes, I'm going to give them permission if they sign a sheet to be able to audio record lectures because I'm the person on campus that um, for Kingsborough um, determines accommodations, talks to students about those things. But um, there are a lot of students that are 
tape recording your lecture right, you know, <laughs> currently. You know, when you're in the classroom, they have their Android phone on. They're not asking you for permission. They don't think they need it. But um, there are a lot of students who are doing that. Or there are students who are going to the Blackboard and taking photos of your notes. So I mean, there are professors who are posting notes on Blackboard. A lot of times when students have immediate access to your notes or no access to your notes the day before, it helps them to learn. Um, a lot of times what will happen is that reading comprehension for a lot of students um, that have learning disabilities is a problem. They're going to need more time. Sometimes they're going to need the text in alternate format. Um, and so sometimes they're going to have adaptive equipment at home where they're going to have their textbook on the computer. Or they hit a button and it gets read to them and their comprehension of the material is going to be better. But one of the things that I brought along that I know is going to be on the website, I have some copies of it, is um, the SQ3R method, which for people who took psychology or teach psychology is probably going to be very familiar. But it's something that teaches students about how to get more material out of a textbook. But one of the things that I would encourage you to do um, for students with learning disabilities or just universal design is, a lot of students are not critical thinkers. They don't know how to read the material that's there. They're just not pacing themselves well. They don't know how to organize it. So the thing is, if they know the SQ3R method and you can go over that, fine. Then they may read it in a much more systematic way, have notes, be able to retain it. But if you would like to do this, what you can sometimes do is put down questions on your syllabus about what would you like them to be able to answer, not on a test necessarily, um, from what they read. So that when they sit down and they open up the book, they're, they're processing in a way that is going to put that information in a framework and that's not going to be more lost and they, you know, they, they won't be quite as lost as they would otherwise. So that would be something that I would um, recommend. Sometimes what you're going to see with students with um, disabilities is that their spelling is absolutely awful. Um, and a lot of times they're going to be able to use about spell check devices if they test with accommodations. Um, but if you are in a class and you are teaching a subject matter where you think that the content is really pretty good, you might want to overlook the spelling. You really might want to overlook the spelling. One of the things um, that I also would kind of attribute to universal design is that um, when people are dysgraphic, they're going to have a lot of motor problems in terms of recording things, doing their um, notes, um, doing their papers. And so sometimes what they'll use is something that's called Dragon Naturally Speaking. Or if they have Windows 7, for free, you know, they can download some software there as long as they have a microphone, and it will train on their voice. Some people, whether they have a disability or they don't, whether it's a learning disability or it's CP, when they speak aloud, their thoughts are not lost. So if they can train software um, to learn their voice, they can produce a better prop, um, not property, but a, a better um, product. Yeah, um, because they, there won't be a lag. There won't be any kind of um, difficulty in terms of coordinating um, what they want to write down. Um, also, not everybody does that well when they outline things. So some people can be encouraged to just take um, index cards, write thoughts down, even random thoughts, and try to figure out how to organize them after the fact, um, because at least they have their ideas there. Um, sometimes getting started is a real problem. A lot of times what they're going to consistently say about um, people with learning disabilities is that a lot of times they are not feeling very confident. And so if you're someone that has some kind of relationship with them, um, you want to start at a point where you think their strength is and encourage them as best as you can. And yes, be realistic. Um, everybody has room for growth, um, but um, hopefully everyone has some kind of potential as well. Um, what you're sometimes going to find is that um, sometimes when students 
have a learning disability and certainly sometimes when students are on the spectrum for autism, um, they're concrete in their thinking. They're not going to understand your jokes. They're not going to understand your metaphors. And sometimes, unfortunately, you're going to have to explain um, because otherwise they're, they're just not at that kind of um, level. Um, in terms of other kinds of strategies, for people who teach math, a lot of times when um, students have difficulty with math, it is um, they have some graphomotor problems also. They have some spatial problems. And so if you give them graph paper um, and you're teaching math, have it line it all up that way. Sometimes they're just going to be able to do the calculations more accurately. Other times they're going to get lost with the symbols. And so um, if you're teaching them negative numbers and positive numbers, you can sometimes encourage them to you know, use red as the negative number so they'll be able to spot it. Any kinds of visual you know, um, clues that a student can get is going to be something that they would benefit from. Um, let me just see. The other thing, too, is that it's always helpful for, for most students, and I think probably all of us have found this as learners, too, is just when you're teaching abstract concepts, the more examples that you can give, the better it will be. And if students can be encouraged to try to adapt the information that they're getting and you know personalize it in some way, chances are they'll be more likely um, to remember it. Um, sometimes, particularly in math and other subjects too, people have learned mnemonic devices, devices for trying to remember important concepts. If that's something that you can share with them, you know, that's beneficial with them. Um, also encouraging the formation of study groups and for the student who is really excelling. Um, they may feel they're doing a favor to other students, and in fact they may be, but the thing is that when students mentor other students, um, their grades improve, so they may get better test scores. So um, they get something out of the experience, and certainly other students who are not doing quite as well could benefit from that. Um, when you give written instructions, if you can also give oral instructions too, that would be helpful. Um, unfortunately, um, people go to college, I think 40% of the people who have learning disabilities, they, yeah, I see all different kinds of numbers on that, um, have a dual diagnosis of attention deficit disorder, sometimes with hyperactivity, sometimes not. So they're going to have difficulty remembering things, and sometimes just people with plain learning disabilities, or not even that, are going to have difficulty keeping track of things. So even though I'm sure on your syllabus you're talking about due dates and things like that, if you can remind them a couple of weeks before things are due, they may be more inclined to turn it in. It's a hard transition. I mean, the feeling is that um, we exit adolescence at the age of 25. So a lot of them were still adolescents, and a lot of them are still having trouble planning things, organizing things. And so, yes, they're responsible for trying to set that up for themselves. But yeah, if you can help them, um, and hopefully they'll be a little bit more independent and get their work in on time. Um, Also, if, when you're selecting textbooks, and I'm pretty sure you're doing this, it, if the better organized they are and the more examples they can give, um, the better learning experience it will be for um, your students. One of the things that I also am going to do as a handout um, is, I know there's probably some English faculty here too, but um, and tutors for English. What happens is often that um, people will have difficulty starting in terms of writing. And um, one of the things that um, we had gotten from a landmark um, college presentation, and they're a two-year institution that deals with people on the spectrum, but 
started out working mostly with students with learning disabilities, but they had a handout for how to like formulate um, paragraphs and how to start things, and it's like fill in the blanks. Um, so there are some good textbooks. Sure. And I think, yeah. Um, but there also was a very nice book um, that's called The Art of Sentence Styling, and it will have 20 different patterns of writing, and students can plug words in there, and, and they will be more elaborate writers. But sometimes students have difficulty getting started, and that gives them a way to be able to start. Um, so in terms of other things, um, if you are tutoring them, and you're trying to figure out how they're going to remember things better. For visual learners, if they're using flashcards, that helps. On one side, they're going to have a definition of something. Not a definition, but a word. And on the other side, hopefully, they'll be able to apply it. Um, if you are people who are tutors, uh, what we do at our school sometimes is um, there are going to be people that are going to have trouble processing everything that's going on. And so um, if you give them permission to audio record your tutoring sessions, that's great. You know, Then they're going to be able to focus a little bit better and retain the information more. Because sometimes what happens, it really it gets lost. Um, what you're also going to find is, and I think I might have mentioned this before, is that um, they're going to have some difficulty with um, following directions. Um, so if written directions could be broken down, that would, that would be somewhat helpful. Um, they're sometimes going to have difficulty shifting from one task to another. That's particularly true for people on the spectrum, but that's also true for students with learning disabilities. Um, any questions? Um, it's hard to say, and they're going to change the diagnosis for Asperger's. Um, there was a period of time where they were thinking that people had what that was called a nonverbal learning disability truly had Asperger's. But from what I've read, it looks like, yes, you truly can have Asperger's and have a learning disability, um, which is kind of interesting because you, you read it and it doesn't quite sound that way, but I've seen some places where they, they will say that, yeah. Well, to talk about disability, mm -hmm. my concern is that, is that the, uh, uh, nowadays the uh, electronic device is very popular. Mm -hmm. So will that cause disability? Because my, I have two kids. Mm -hmm. I think they are OK. Mm -hmm. So but the thing is that I realized that um, because they play so much computer and mm -hmm. iPad, now their skill in learning is actually decaying, especially the my older son, and, and getting really concerned because if I take away their um, electronic device, he wouldn't be happy. <laughs> but uh, but on the other hand, I really start worried because he used to be very smart, but now he couldn't get a conclusion like in mean, reading something, especially in reading. So I think. One hand that people try to teach, on the other hand, because the society, like the new technology, they are creating disability. There are some people who agree with you. They're not going to go to the extent where they're going to say that it's a disability, but I think they are going to say that they do not think that critical thinking skills for incoming freshmen are like they were 40 years ago. That something where, even Sesame Street, where everybody had to be entertained and you had to jump from one thing to another, is that a lot of the things that were taught years ago are expected or no longer expected. And I think um, there has been, they're trying to look at some research to see if there are some kinds of like neurological differences because of the, the technology. But 
um, you're wondering if it does have something to do with attention spans, you know, is the people not going off and feeling content to just read, you know, in a, in a corner. But um, that's, that's a difficult one. Um, uh, first of all, uh, my older son's math skill right, mm -hmm. has not been improved for two years already. Because I, like two years ago, I taught him something, he, he knew it. Mm -hmm. But then when he went to school, well, of course, the school didn't do a good job. They basically made sure they are happy. But then I realized that not only not improving, it's decaying. So I, and this trend, I get, I'm getting a little bit worried. I mean, there probably is some good educational software and math that he might even find enjoyable. There probably still is that kind of thing. But yeah, you wonder what's happening with um, the social media to a certain extent, all the blogs that are posting information that's not accurate, um, or just people that are more visually stimulated that are not going to be so interested in you know, auditory <laughs> presentations. But yeah, it's a... Uh, It'll be interesting to see what evolves. I, I'm just worried that by the time they get a conclusion, it's already too late. <laughs> because, because some of the teachers in, in public school, sometimes I usually don't go to the PTA meeting. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I went there, I, I suppose some of, some of the teachers. Then I, after a while, I realized that this, they themselves have lack of a, what do you call it, a critical thinking skill. Mm -hmm. Like the argument they give you and, and, and all, all kind of things that uh, it's very... So basically, when the, when, the, when the educators themselves have something trouble, and then the, the new generation will have more trouble, right? Because it's like a, a feedback, right? It's not just, a, you see the, I mean, I, I wonder, I mean, I wonder what will happen with the educational system because so many things are going online. You know, so you're wondering how many people are going to be sitting at home and doing their papers and just, uh, you know, they're texting already. Um, there may be some writing skills that are actually developed earlier. I mean, it's <laughs> or computer skills. I, I don't know, you know, but. My neighbor's uh, son, he told me, and um, He's a math teacher. Mm -hmm. He cannot without uh, iPhone for five minutes. Yeah. Like the guy will write on the board for like a few minutes, then right away need to check the cell, and then continue and then check it. Just so that, that for me that seems some kind of disorder. But no, I know I know what you're saying. It's it's almost. I'm not saying it's OCD, but if, I mean if you must look at your iPhone all the time or you must do this and you have a problem. That's not a good thing, but maybe eventually it will. Well, Gail is going to hang around for the second half of our time together um, when we talk about inclusive service learning, which again, service learning is a high impact strategy and some folks argue that if we engage uh, more high impact strategies in the classroom, we're going to be engaging more um, students, different kinds of learners through all these different high impacts. So. Um, I think it's directly related to some of what she taught us today. Um, we're going to take a few minutes to get set up for the webinar, and um, I encourage you to eat more because there's more food here, um, and certainly to stick around um, as we get this set up for the next hour. Um, so um, thank you for staying for the second half of our time today. Uh, we are going to be speaking with uh, Paula Sotnik, Jason Wheeler, and Felicia Wilsinski about ser uh, inclusive service learning. And um, these uh, wonderful individuals represent um, the um, service um, inclusion project as well as the National Service Inclusion Project as well as the Institute for Community Inclusion. And I'd like to just make note of the fact that they are at University of Massachusetts Boston. Um, unfortunately, what happened um, on Patriots Day happened in their own backyard, so we want to thank them for being here with us today and pulling things together at a really difficult time. So thank you. And uh, we look forward to uh, learning from you. So, I'll, Jason, I'll turn it over to you. You're able to hear me? I can. I can hear you well. Thanks, Amy. Um, so, good afternoon, everybody. And, uh, Amy, thank you for acknowledging what, what happened here on, on Monday. It's been a, a challenging few days for the city. But uh, uh, I will tell you, you know, people often talk about Boston being a very resilient place. And uh, it, it's now 
at the point where we're hearing just incredible stories of how people have been involved and in caring for each other. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very positive time, you know, the, these, these couple of days, although we're still experiencing significant uh, loss here. Yeah, we can understand that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I just want to, um, again, introduce myself. My name is Jason Wheeler, and uh, as Amy said, I'm with the Institute for Community Inclusion at UMass Boston. Um, and I'm joined with uh, two colleagues, um, and I'll have them both introduce themselves, um, both Paula Sotnik and Felicia, uh, Dr. Felicia Wilczynski. Um, I'm going to give you a minute to introduce yourselves, if you don't mind, and only because I want people to be able to get uh, uh, voice recognition, if you will. Paula, why don't you start? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. This is Paula Sotnik. So glad to be here. Um, and uh, glad to be talking and uh, facilitating this training virtually. Thanks, Paula. And I'm Felicia Wilzenski, and I'm very happy that you're interested in this topic of inclusive service learning. Um, I got sold on service learning when I did it with my own students in graduate classes and um, have been um, very much interested in its positive impact for students of all ages. And so um, I thank you for your interest in it and look forward to talking with you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're hoping that the content that we're going to present to you today um, brings into play some of the content that maybe you've learned in, in past sessions. I know that you've been doing some uh, work around inclusion and some work around universal design um, and service learning. Uh, and so we're looking to sort of package some of that together and think about inclusive service learning, um, specifically engaging individuals who have disabilities, um, those from diverse cultures, um, uh, folks who are maybe non-traditional, if you will, uh, involved in uh, service learning. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how we're going to spend our time together. Um, we have a, a basic overview for you of the session. Uh, we're going to start off with just talking generally about um, what is inclusive service learning and why it's important. Um, we're going to do a little bit of foundation building by talking through um, who are people with disabilities and fostering um, learning environments that welcome disability disclosure. Um, then we're going to identify some key elements around uh, inclusive service learning and then close with um, a case study, some application around or how, how you would apply universal design for learning to uh, a service learning type project. Um, and then we have a few resources um, that we'd like to offer you towards the end. Great. Just some general sort of housekeeping things. Um, if for some reason you need to mute the line there, Amy, um, you would just hit star six on your phone. Okay. Just do us a favor and don't put the call on hold. Okay. Although I guess it doesn't matter since we're only using one line. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Oftentimes we, we will use large groups and somebody will put us on hold and we'll hear music for 10 minutes. Oh, we wouldn't um, do that to you. So star six if you have to mute for some reason um, on your end. And then um, just sort of general um, reminders. One is that we really hope, and this is a little bit easier when we're in person, we hope to be able to create a safe space here today for us to be able to engage in a little bit of dialogue and recognize that technology is challenging to do that. Um, but if you have questions, we really would encourage you to, um, uh, to text those in. You can ask Amy, you can pass a note to Amy, and she could text message us through the chat feature um, on the uh, computer, or, you know, feel free to interrupt us, and, you know, Amy, if you don't mind being a voice or relaying for us, um, since you seem to be at the front of the room and closest to the phone, that would be helpful. No problem. Uh, just to add to that, uh, no, no question is too trivial, um, you know, or too small, or don't worry about it's the wrong, sh you know, should I be asking this question? Lots of times when, when we do disability training or we talk to somebody with, uh, about disability, it tends to be a sensitive topic and people are somewhat uh, hesitant or concerned that they're going to ask the wrong thing, but we really want this to be very comfortable, safe environment. Great. Um, and then finally, uh, it doesn't flow well coming right off of creating a safe environment, but we are recording today's call. Um, and the only reason that we're recording today's, today's call is that um, we like to be able to uh, offer the content to other folks periodically um, should they need to. Um, it also helps us as presenters to be able to go back and, and look at 
um, content and, and refresh our minds around sort of questions that you might have, things of that nature. Well, we were we, we are, are recording uh, you recording, recording us. Today. Yeah. Um, on that note, um, Felicia, if it's okay with you, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, and we're going to start with uh, making the case for inclusive service learning. Thank you, Jason. Um, well, I thought I would start by just making sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what we mean by service learning, because as I've talk to people about it, there's sometimes a range of what people consider service learning from community service to actually what the more uh, formal definition of service learning is. And essentially what we're talking about here is service that is connected to the curriculum. So that the community service or whatever the service project is has some very intentional connections to um, either an academic curriculum. Um, in some cases, a social or an emotional com curriculum, career development curriculum. So um, it, it really, you know, you can define curriculum broadly, but the service is always connected in that way. Um, so, you know, we, we're we looking, uh, there's another element to this too, and that is that um, the benefits are both to the server and to the community. So that in service learning, the projects are um, designed to be of mutual benefit. So they're authentic projects that, that students do in the community. It's not something that we concoct so that they have something to do or something to reflect on, but rather that you have a community partner who will benefit from um, the service that is provided. So it's a kind of two-way interaction. So those are the, the kind of primary um, issues in defining service learning, connected to the community and, uh, to, and to curriculum goals and also connected to the community in a way that it's a true partnership where the community will benefit as does the person doing the service. And, you know, service learning, because community projects are so multifaceted, is, is just um, a wonderful opportunity to include um, students who have all kinds of learning styles and, and um, learning needs. So it's, a, it's a, a, a pedagogical strategy that can um, be inclusive for students who, are, um, who have certain kinds of disabilities because everyone can contribute to a complex project at whatever level using their strengths um, to contribute. So uh, service learning, almost by its nature, is an inclusive strategy. And of course, it's experiential, so there's a lot of hands-on and a lot of um, opportunities for students to get engaged in various ways. Um, how do I move the slide? <laughs> Jason? Sorry, I'll, I can advance slides for you, so just say when you'd like to. Okay, okay, now we're, we're up to what inclusion is, but could you switch that now to principles? One of, one of the um, kind of the, the thinking that goes into how can we include everyone in a service project also um, is compatible with ideas generated around universal design. And um, universal design for learning is the idea that um, as an instructor, we try to plan instruction in such a way that it's um, able to, that we are able to, you know, really reach students have, who have different learning styles, different variabilities, students with disabilities. And so, um, you know, one of the, the, some of the principles of universal design that service learning you know, taps into are that, you know, service projects are complicated. So there's a number of ways to um, allow students to engage with the project and to understand. One of the major um, benefits of service is that it is such a meaningful experience for students that they can really understand social issues, they can understand what's going on because it, it is an authentic kind of experience. It also allows students to, you know, express themselves or provide um, feedback to their instructors in multiple ways. And it all relates to the complexity of a project. So it's easy to think of ways that students can contribute and students can also provide, um, you know, an output to an instructor. 
And, you know, it just, uh, it, you know, with a really engaging kind of service project, the motivation is just so easy to tap into. And this is what sold me on service learning when I attempted it with two of my graduate level courses. Um, the students went out to the community. I will admit there was a little bit of upfront work, but once they got engaged, it, they were so motivated and brought back so much to the classroom that they actually made the rest of the semester sort of easy for me because they had such a wealth of information to draw on. They were enthusiastic and um, in ways that I could not have communicated to them um, through lecture in the classroom or you know, um, sort of simulations and so forth. So it really provided, um, you know, a ready-made motivational system for them to have gone out to the community and experienced some of what they did. Um, in, in implementing service learning, there are certain models that people talk about. You can switch the slide, Jason. And one is the PAR model, and, and most of the models for implementing service learning run along this way, and there are many different PAR models using essentially different words. But, you know, the first piece is preparing for the service experience, and this is the part where you need to find a project. Um, it is best if students can recognize and figure out a project that needs um, that needs to be done in the community, but if not, and sometimes with the press of a semester or a school year, um, you know, an instructor can kind of guide students into an appropriate kind of service experience. Um, and it also involves at this preparation stage working with the community partner to ensure that, again, that, that the service will be of mutual benefit to not only the student, but that the community partner will benefit from, um, you know, the service that will be rendered. And, you know, this is, this is where you kind of talk up the project and um, get students interested in, in, in seeing how this will also benefit them in terms of their learning in your classes, in terms of the curriculum you're de uh, delivering. Um, you can move to the next slide, Jason, which is action. And this is where students actually do the service. Um, in my case with graduate students, I had them function as educational sur surrogate parents for students who were in state custody who did not have parents to advocate for them in special education um, uh, hearings or, or evaluation where, you know, an an educational plan was developed, and so my students acted as educational sur surrogate parents and actually took the role of a parent, which was important in their learning because they were school psychology majors who at some point would be sitting on the other side of the table talking to parents. And then another project I did was to have um, school counseling students act as um, mentors for first-year a freshman first year students at the univer at UMass Boston who um, were you know kind of at risk for perhaps um, you know failing their first year and most of those students needed mentoring about negotiating the university so school counseling students um, were their mentors and this was an important learning for them because School counselors work at the K through 12 level, but it was important for them to understand um, what the jump to a college or a university setting is like for a student because many counselors work at the high school level and so therefore, you know, need to understand both sides of the equation. So those were the, the two um, sort of service projects that I was involved in as an instructor in a classroom. And since then have worked on others in a more consultation basis. But this is where, um, you know, you're building relationships in the service project, you are, um, uh, you know, and the students are out there working. Next slide, Jason. Reflection um, is, a lot of people have called reflection the hyphen between service and learning. It's what makes, it's where the learning occurs in service learning. And this is where the instructor 
um, can guide students in thinking about the experience and you know how it connects with their with your curriculum that you're delivering or with their future plans in life um, for a career. And so, you know, students need to reflect on the kinds of problems they may see in the community and grapple with them, um, reflect on, you know, how they might problem solve. Um, in, and, um, you know, this is, a, this is important as we're preparing the future citizens and future leaders in our country that, that they see themselves as, as having a role in terms of being a problem solver. So taking time to have students do journals or um, sometimes electronic portfolios, something where they have to take some time either individually or in a group and, and ideally in both situations to think about their learning in the community to grapple with the problems they've encountered and to try to figure out solutions to those problems. I actually, in one of my graduate classes, um, the very first semester I did this, um, I wasn't, it wasn't as well organized as I usually like to be. And I, I thought, oh my god, the students are really thinking this is very disorganized and not a good um, experience for them, so I decided to use some of these principles and threw that back at them and, and asked them to help me problem solve around this service, and they provided that service to me in class. And so together we worked out better strategies for organizing how to arrange the service experience. And then finally, recognition. And this is an important stage as well, to kind of assess the outcomes, to think about how um, both the students have learned and the community has benefited, and to celebrate that um, with students. It's important that, you know, we all need recognition and, um, you know, the, the, the service shouldn't just fade away, but there should be some recognition of how the students have contributed and, and also what they've learned. So there's several levels of transformation going on. Individually, students are empowered by this experience and they also can acquire the skills that you're hoping to convey to them through your curriculum. And also community trans transformations. And in this case, when we talk about inclusion with students with disabilities, the students with disabilities are, are functioning as servers, um, not servees. Um, often students with disabilities are the recipients of service, but in this case, when we talk about students with disabilities, they're very much in a service role in the community. So, you know, that's a piece of the inclusion where Students with and without disabilities or persons with, a, with and without disabilities are working together. And that also, you know, can transform a community in terms of how they see a person with a disability as a contributor and not as, you know, only a recipient of, of service. So, you know, we're... We're hoping, and, and I think you'll hear this when, when Paula talks more about inclusion, but you know, service learning has so much potential in so many different areas to enhance students' learning um, that we need to think more about how to include uh, students with disabilities in service learning um, and allow them you know, the greater range of opportunities that going out to the community and experiencing um, you know, community service can, um, can bring for them. And so that's what we're looking for, and I'd be interested in hearing your experiences or your thoughts as well about um, where we are and where we should be going. And just a few things to keep in mind as you implement inclusive service learning. It has to be intentional. That's the, the discussion about linking it to curriculum goals. Um, you have to, you know, look at your role as a mentor, look at, you know, the community partners and how they will work with the students. And again, um, you know, the, I, the ideal is to have an equal partnership where students benefit and the community benefits. And again, strategies using universal design is, uh, just fits so well with service because you have a ready-made, multifaceted, um, 
exper learning experience for students uh, who can participate in whatever ways their strengths and learning styles dictate. So that's kind of a, in, in a nutshell. So it's service learning extended to think about how it is a, you know, a great strategy for including everyone in a project and how that can benefit individual students but the community at large as well. Thanks, Felicia. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? This is Paula. Yes, Paula. Thank you. Thanks, great. Felicia. Thank you. Um, uh, we're going to ask you to hold questions and thoughts till the end. We're on a pretty tight schedule and we want to leave enough time for the case study activity in the end where you apply your skills and knowledge and that is the most important thing of any training in terms of um, the application, not, not what, what we say pretty much, although that is somewhat important. Um, but the next section, the next module, we're going to get into some pretty concrete um, concepts and ideas and strategies around, around disability inclusion. So the first slide that we have is a definition of disability. Um, and you'll, you'll note that some of the um, uh, words are underlined. Uh, but we're going to talk about disability as defined by Section 504 of the Rehab Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that's pretty much whether you, you're in school or work or uh, service learning or national service, this is pretty much the uh, Bible in terms of the definition that we follow. So it seems pretty clear uh, cut and upfront, uh, but you'll notice a certain language that is really important to pay attention in terms of how disability is defined um, legally. Uh, first of all, it's a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, the, the first thing I'd like to bring uh, bring up is the word impairment. We tend not to use that word anymore. We tend to use person first language for people with disabilities, but um, because uh, this was written a while ago and it's Department of Justice, we don't fool around with their definitions, but we're going to keep that as is. Um, but the word substantially, we're going to ask you a question about what that means uh, in a second. The other caveat that's not written in here is that it's long lasting. So the disability is not a broken leg that's going to last for a few months. This is long lasting. The second is having a record or history of such an impairment. Um, the third definition factor is being regarded as having such an impairment, even when no limitations exist, which is interesting. Um, and then also is the fourth one is someone who has an association with someone with a disability. So you'll notice some of the definition entails people who may not directly have a disability but is associated with someone who has a disability or has a record of having a disability. And the rationale for that is that uh, any, any discrimination, for example, I have a son who has a disability, I mention that to an employer um, at work and they don't hire me because they're afraid that my son has a lot of doctor's appointments and mm -hmm. it'll keep me from my job. I'm being discriminated against because of association. Um, so that's one example. So the next example, the next thing we're going to do um, is Jason's going to bring up what she calls the whiteboard. And I'm glad he knows how to do this because I'm not technology guru here. So, um, and we're going to ask a couple of questions. Um, and we're going to ask you to either shout this out or maybe, Amy, if you're close by and you don't mind doing this, maybe you can scribe some of the things uh, in uh, on the whiteboard uh, that people are saying that we may not hear. Okay. But I'm going to ask you, what is the first thing that you hear of when you uh, look at some of the important words here? Uh, substantially, having a history or record, being regarded as having an impairment, someone who has an association. Uh, tell me what those mean. What do you think they mean? Okay, major life activities, what are those things? And anything, you can pick any one and just shout, shout it out or, um, or maybe Amy can scribe it and we'll put it up on the whiteboard for you. Pardon me? Oh, okay. Um, so I'm trying to type but it's not working so I'll talk. Okay. Um, so Jo says uh, she thinks immediately of IEPs. Uh-huh. So someone who has been on an IEP. Okay. Anybody else? And again, no wrong answer. Don't be afraid to shout it out. What's the first thing that comes to mind in terms of the definition of disability and those important words that the law states? I think I'm interested in the um, 
the presence of a perception of a disability as opposed to the actual disability itself? Sure, yep, yep. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. Any more? Let's get a couple more up there. Accommodations or adjustments needed? Um, Mavis says accommodations or adjustments needed. Yep, excellent. Anybody else? Exceptional strengths that that, may, that person may have that need to be addressed or should be addressed. Okay, so uh, we also have mention of the strengths or the exceptional strengths that people also bring to the table that should be addressed. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, this is doing a terrific job of typing here. Okay. Um, let's actually go on to the next slide, and then I'm going to uh, actually address some of these things. But some of these might answer uh, our questions on the next slide. So, um, are you able to come back to that? Okay. So, let's talk about what major life activity is uh, in terms of some of the, that word that is used. A major life activity is really anything an average person can do with little or no difficulty. So, as you can see here, it's caring for oneself, speaking, breathing, learning, wording. Working, sitting, standing, lifting. It, I won't read them all, but it really is anything that what is considered an average person can do. Um, a person with a disability has difficulty. It really impacts their major life activity. Case in point, if I have asthma, um, slight asthma, I can walk around the block, not get winded. It really doesn't impact me. I might have to use my nebulizer. However, if I walk half a block and I have to sit down and I am really winded and I can't breathe, that constitutes a disability. So again, it's that significantly substantial and also long-term. Um, with the new ADA amendment, uh, we're talking about other types of things added like immune system, normal cell growth, uh, and the endocrine um, system. Um, so let's address a couple of these questions uh, back here. You, right, you can go back to the whiteboard. I just want to talk about one in particular. Um, and Jason's got to work his magic here. Thanks, Jason. You're, aren't you glad that worked? I can tell by your face. You can't see us here. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the perception of a disability. I'll use an example to point that out. Um, years ago, we had a project that helped uh, guys and gals who had HIV and AIDS um, change career goals or change their careers because they couldn't, because of their illness, couldn't work in, in the same career. Could have been manual labor, and they just couldn't do that anymore. Um, and so uh, I was meeting these guys initially who were telling me that um, they were openly gay, and because they were applying to a, they were applying for jobs in a restaurant, it was automatically assumed that that everybody, every gay man, woman who was open had HIV AIDS, and they weren't getting hired because of that. Now AIDS is a disability um, because they were perceived as having a disability. They were being discriminated against. So even though they weren't having the disability, they could mm -hmm. actually sue uh, under the law because they were being discriminated against around disability. Does that make sense? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So why don't we go on to the next one? Um, and we're really going to start developing a foundation here um, and um, talk about disclosure, which is probably the most significant thing and most sensitive thing in the disability world. Uh, for many of us, just a case in point, uh, most of us, most of us, uh, most people with disabilities have what's called non-apparent, or sometimes you'll see hidden disabilities, but that's not used too much. But most people who have disabilities have non-apparent disabilities, um, and and they are by far the most difficult in terms of disclosure or to ask an accommodation for. Um, so it's likely that you might have a student, few students, uh, service learning students in your class. Um, and you're noticing something that's a little bit different than the norm. They might be participating differently. They might be reading differently, not getting something. They're not disclosing. They might have a learning disability, for example. Um, it's not to assume everybody has a disability, but that could often be true. Um, and so the, the appropriate thing or the easy thing would be for them to be able to disclose to you, hey, I have a disability that really impacts my learning, and I need this type of accommodation. Yeah, that sounds really good, but it's so difficult to do. Um, we did a, a bit of a research project here at ICI on disclosure a few years back, um, and we found, asked people, why didn't you disclose your disability? Why is it so hard? Um, and they told us a few interesting things. One is that the environment was gossipy, so whether this be school,
will work, you know, it's a gossipy environment, and they were afraid that it was excessively competitive. Uh, it was racially insensitive. They, people had a fear of potential reactions. Of course, that's, that's normal to be wonder what uh, the other kids, the other students will say or teachers. Um, also, in this case, that um, they, they were afraid that uh, others would not want to share their equipment or workspace if it was a health-related disability. But also, on the other side, people found that it wasn't relevant. Um, that they didn't have to disclose, it didn't impact any of their life, so they didn't feel it was important and their disability didn't define them. Um, and then also there's a stigma, of course we know that stigma disclose associated with disabilities, and a lot of times people didn't disclose to their co other close friends um, first, and sometimes family members, so they didn't want to disclose to the external circle, because they hadn't disclosed to their own family. So, so, you know, you can imagine how difficult it is for some, some people. Uh, the next slide is the impact of not disclosing. So how does this impact someone? Uh, a lot of social isolation. They didn't get close to others because of, uh, they didn't want any personal questions. They felt compelled to misrepresent. So they said they were part of a nutrition study or a different diagnosis. People are unable to request accommodations because you can't, you can't request an accommodation anywhere unless you disclose what your disability is. You don't have to do the diagnosis, but you have to identify if you want to get a reasonable accommodation that uh, you have a disability. They, of course, reported less support than other people did, and there was also a lot of stress related with keeping the secret. So here, the next slide, is just some uh, things to remember or guidelines about disclosure. Uh, and this is, uh, again, according to the law, it's up to each individual to decide if they wish to disclose their disability. It's up to the individual to decide how much information they wish to disclose about their disability. Um, and they, it's also up to the individual to decide who has access to information about their disability, um, including requesting uh, reasonable accommodations. And if an individual does disclose, that information must be maintained confidentially and cannot be disclosed to others. And I realize sometimes it poses a problem if you happen to be a teacher and the reasonable accommodation or disclosure entails uh, other people, like the service learning site will get, should I tell the service learning site supervisor or people there. You really can't do that unless you get permission, and I would say written permission from that student. What we've been doing is guiding the student or the person, um, guiding them in the, in the reasons why it would be good to share their disability if, they're, if they need a reasonable accommodation. Um, and often the student will recognize that and be able to be comfortable in sharing that. Um, the other thing, and, and we have lots of information on this and we'd be happy to talk through this, is um, really to uh, create an environment such as we did here um, to make it comfortable for people to tolerate differences and also um, uh, also share their disability. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the characteristics of an inclusive classroom um, and go through these real quickly because Jason is giving me the time signal here. <laughs> and, um, but again, you know, we are totally available after this webinar to think things through or brainstorm with you. Um, characteristics of an inclusive classroom. This is about creating a culture or an environment that where people, other people don't ask questions in terms of why is this person being accommodated or I would feel comfortable saying I have a disability by changing uh, this in our environment. Uh, assuring that the classroom is usable by students with different characteristics, including accessible workstations, appropriate lighting, uh, and that's the thing that we think about the most is the accessibility part. That's the first thing that comes to mind. But it also uh, means perhaps using more text, more pictorials instead of, I'm sorry, less text, uh, or more pictorials or, or uh, symbols, international symbols with the text, for example, uh, photographs instead of text. Uh, so people have that multiple way of learning. Um, when you go to an airport, I've just come back from Arizona, so I noticed this in the airport. You really don't have to read text. You can tell where the bank is, where the bathrooms are, what the ladies' room is, where you get your suitcases just by those pictorial uh, international symbols. Uh, second thing, build and maintain an environment where all students feel comfortable. Jason started out by saying that we wanted this to be a sensitive uh, 
but we wanted this topic is sensitive, so we wanted this to be a very comfortable, safe environment. Um, and that's something you might think about in terms of starting um, the classroom off with, or the service learning project. Uh, that no question is too trivial, you might do that already. And also repeating that is a good thing to put people at ease. Um, reviewing course content from multiple standpoints, of course, service learning does that. You're taking something that's very conceptual and abstract and applying it uh, concretely. Um, and including research and writings from authors of diverse backgrounds. So it doesn't always have to be scholarly. A lot of times we'll use people with disabilities who may not have their PhDs or degrees, but they write about their own experience as part of, um, as part of it. Um, using multiple teaching methods to, act, to aid academic success. Uh, we have um, uh, accessible presentation guidelines um, that that we uh, that we use when we do training or presentation. Simple things like facing people in case people read uh, read lips, um, offering handouts, uh, saying things verbally, uh, and also having uh, things on the overhead so there's multiple means of representation. Using pictures or videos because the adult learner has the attention span of about two seconds. Um, <laughs> And we can't see right now, so you might be falling asleep and we have no movies for you, but sorry about that. Uh, a lot of times we'll use uh, what we call tchotchkes for training, because a lot of people are tactile learners and they have to fuss with something. So I don't know if you have students who may knit in your classes, um, but they have to be doing something with their hands to learn. So offering those types of universally designed types of things that someone doesn't have to request an accommodation for a learning disability, this might be taking care of some of that. Um, okay, uh, the very last thing, because I know I'm getting short on time and I'm not going to go through those other characteristics, but this gets really con concrete. I'm going to just share a little bit on sample inclusion strategies with you. Um, we're working on a table that combines the eight elements of successful service learning um, and the phases or the sequence of service learning that Felicia went through. So on your left, you'll see uh, something, it says meaningful service, student voice, and partnership. These are three of eight elements that, if you go through the literature um, and also through experiential, um, it, it will tell you that you, you should try to have these eight elements uh, to have a successful service learning project. Um, and the, the resources actually are at the end of our PowerPoint, so you can look at the full article. On the top, of course, is the sequence. Uh, what we're, we're trying to do is look at each of the elements in each of the phases of service learning and provide concrete examples of what does that mean in terms of accessibility, accommodation, uh, and universal design. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of these, but let's take meaningful service and planning and prep. Uh, one of the things that you don't want to happen is to have someone who uses uh, a mobility aid like a wheelchair or um, a walker, and then realize when you get to the service learning project that it's not accessible. Uh, so doing something like a full accessibility pre-assessment or sending a checklist to the service learning site might be a good idea. Um, and we have accessibility checklists that you can certainly have um, and uh, that might help you. Um, let's look at the second thing in terms of student voice, uh, in terms of planning and preparation, the action phase and the reflection phase and evaluation and recognition. Uh, assess learning styles, identify their visual, tactile, auditory methods, uh, so that kind of that assessment uh, to enable all students to express choices. Uh, in action, use digital storytelling, like not everything is about writing, so digital storytelling might help them to have an alternative voice. Students might choose to draw before and after pictures to describe how their experience changed them during the reflection phase. Um, and then in terms of, uh, Felicia said that the uh, service learning project benefits both the individual and the community. Uh, and one of the things that we've uh, talked about is how has this changed the student? Is the student going to talk about, well, gee, this service learning project really changed me and I've really changed my mind and I'm going to do a lifetime of civic engagement because of what I worked on. Instead of uh, writing about it or talking about it, uh, maybe the students can photograph role models that they feel, Mother Teresa, for example, 
that indicate their future personal goals. And this oftentimes is good for people who might have intellectual or cognitive disabilities. Um, just one other thing on the last section is uh, when you're talking about partnerships, picking partners for your service learning project, uh, the disability organizations uh, you probably have relationships with, but they help uh, immensely in terms of um, assisting and developing some uh, inclusive action plans during the planning prep. Uh, they might be able to share resources. For example, each state has a state technology um, site that uh, agency that might be able to share some assistive technology. They can serve as consultants on access and accommodations. Um, and they can also provide testimonials at the end on how the service learning project was so inclusive. So this is kind of a really very small nutshell of what we're trying to do, uh, and we'd love to share this with you at a later time. We're also going to provide one of these sheets that uh, don't have the examples that will be blank um, and that you could perhaps use as an alternative planning sheet um, to um, to write examples or write things that you have to think about for inclusive uh, service learning. Um, well, we went through kind of a really speedy kind of strategy and some concrete examples, uh, and now you're going to take all this knowledge and apply it, which is the fun part, and I'm going to hand it over to Jason. Sure. So I think Amy has, had given you a handout. Um, the handout that you received um, has uh, pretty much all of the details of the case study. But just in the interest of um, being universally designed, I'm going to go through quickly the case study with you and then allow you to sort of pair up with the person next to you to have a bit of a conversation with regard to the worksheet that's on the opposite side of or, or next page, um, depending on how it's printed, uh, of the case study. So let me give you the nutshell version of our, of our case study. Right now we're creating an inclusive service learning project. Um, and let me first start by saying that the classroom that you're working with, the general demographics of that classroom, are that there are 22 students total, 13 female, 9 male. Three of the students have disclosed disabilities. Um, others may certainly have not apparent disabilities, but only three have disclosed. Um, of those disclosed disabilities, students describe themselves as having disabilities related to learning, health, or autism. Um, and then finally, all students um, are English speaking, however, a few of them have fairly limited proficiency. Um, the, the course that, that folks are in um, is a, um, a sociological education course, uh, and essentially uh, the key to that particular course is that students are going to examine a variety of topics related to education, learning, schools, um, the processes, uh, educational systems, and critically, they're going to look at these, these um, theoretical perspectives and how they relate to a concrete service experience. Um, the course is designed as a service learning course, um, specifically, um, and it's um, intended to engage a number of community partners, local schools, um, and the students will be meeting a critical need, which is essentially um, they'll be reading to students who are identified as being below grade average. Uh, or below grade level. Um, the overall design of the service learning project is that there are some things that are required of all students. Uh, so for instance, um, all students will be required to perform at least 10 tutoring sessions. They'll have to do required readings. They'll have to participate in classroom discussions. And then um, beyond those, those sort of required pieces, there are two options that students will be able to go through. Um, the first option is that they could take a tutoring intensive track. Um, in this particular track, in addition to the required pieces, um, students would have to um, tutor twice a week, so at least 20 times. They would have to do the required readings and do summaries of those required readings. Um, and they'd have to participate in reflection of service and participate in discussions regarding the um, required and supplemental readings. They could also choose option two, which is the reading intensive track. And students who choose this particular track would only tutor once a week in the classroom um, for a minimum of 10. They would do the required readings. They would also be required to read the supplementary um, readings and prepare written summaries of those. Um, and in addition, um, they would 
um, engage in all of the uh, general classroom discussions around both um, the recommended as well as the uh, supplementary readings. So what we'd like you to do, um, and this might be a little challenging, but is um, cluster up with, with people around you. It does not really have to be five or six people. It could just be the person who's next to you. Um, take the worksheet that you have, um, and we'd like you to use this particular case study to brainstorm how you would apply principles of universal design to this particular service learning project. Um, or you can describe sort of how this current service learning project is already universal designed because there are some strategies already built in there. Um, and then we'd like to just share out a couple of ideas, one or two thoughts that you might have um, in each of these particular um, areas or things that you might feel are particularly important. Jason, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm going to have to ask you maybe to jump in to share that um, with us more directly because I know that most folks have classes at three and we're going to have to give over the space at that time. Okay. Um, so then what, what I would say is that in the interest of time um, to maybe use this as a bit of a worksheet that you can use when um, moving um, – uh, when, when you're going in and doing some design of service learning projects to ensure that they are inclusive of people with disabilities, to use these principles of universal design and thinking through. And we're happy to work with folks one-on-one um, -on -one as well. We've included content, um, or we've included our contact information. Um, so uh, let me jump to the resource slide here um, so that you have it. Um, I think the most important thing that if you are jotting things down right now is to look at the third one, which is the um, presentation handouts. The URL is serviceandinclusion.org slash presentations. Um, that will allow you to download all the PowerPoints that we've used today as well as this worksheet. It also has all of our contact information on it. That's great. And I think that handout is going to be really constructive as we plan as a campus um, you know, our service learning projects and also more individually um, in our courses. Absolutely. Amy, do we have any uh, time for a question or two? Uh, we have about, I think, five minutes. Is that possible? Sure. Or? I'm going to invite, anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Go ahead. Are they saying that the uh, resources page, are they going to email it to us or we have to I, I just took a picture of the resources page, and so I'll put them up on our website, and we're going to link to them um, from our website, and also we're going to archive this whole presentation, so you'll be able to actually view it again and actually see this page again. You. You're welcome. You're welcome. Hi. Here is not the password, So I think we are all set with questions, and I'm certainly sorry that we have to run. But um, you've done such a great job setting the foundation for us to think about this important topic in service learning, and we want to thank you for that. Great. Thank you very much. If you want to do a part two, we're certainly willing to, uh, to do that, and it could be all application. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. Okay. And I'll, I'll reach out to you all again via email with some follow-ups, um, and um, I encourage anybody else who has questions as you implement service learning projects to reach out to them. They're very generous. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, Amy, we're going to go ahead and send you a link as well, if you don't mind, for an evaluation for this, if you wouldn't mind just disseminating it to folks. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.